Hello, welcome. We are excited that you are joining us. We want to extend a special welcome to those of you in Stillwater Prison, but happy to have all of you that are watching and listening today. I'm Pastor Nancy, and this is Wayne and Dolores. And so if you've tuned in on any of these messages that we've taped previously, we are part of the ministry team uh, for Stillwater Prison. And because of COVID, we have not been able to go in. So we miss you guys. We're hoping to see you soon in person. But Brother Wayne's got an amazing message, and so I'm going to turn it over. Go ahead. All right. Um, it's around Easter time here, and so we've been spending some time in some of the scriptures that's talking about Jesus' um, death and, and resurrection. And so I was reading Mark 15, 3, and this was the scripture that stood out to me. It says, the chief priests accused him, Jesus, of many things. So again, Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? Verse 5 says, but Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. And so to me, the thing that stood out was Jesus' supernatural ability to be quiet. <laughs> yeah. In a situation where he could have did anything, he was quiet. So sometimes the most spiritual or righteous or religious thing that we can do is to shut up. <laughs> That's <was> good. <laughs> Quite often we're right and we feel this need to tell somebody, I am right, you are wrong. But Jesus, in this instance, he kept quiet. Just because you're a Christian don't mean that you are not going to have no problems. And so when those problems arise, it's um, important how we respond. We are representative of the kingdom. We are ambassadors. And so if this is a characteristic that Jesus shows, shouldn't we want to mimic that? So in Isaiah 53, 7, Pastor Steve was spending some time in there. He went on further. He says, he was oppressed, Jesus, and this is the uh, prophetic uh, from Isaiah saying this, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as his sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And as Christians, again, we think that we have this right, or non-Christians even. This is, it is my right. I am right. I'm going to say something. But Jesus kept quiet. You would think that if Jesus demonstrated this, then we would want to model after it. But Galatians 5, 22, 23, and feel free to jump in if any of that resonates with you. Well, I thought of uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And only those things that are blessings, that it would impart grace to the hearer. So that's Ephesians 4, 29. But you're right. There are times when we will find ourselves. I have been in situations a couple of times um, where due to the circumstances, I had to just be quiet could not defend myself. I knew that if I said anything, it would just make matters worse. And I had to wait. And here's the deal. If your ways please the Lord, he'll make even your enemies to be at peace with you. And so that's kind of mature Christianity, right? When you can hold your peace and not engage, especially if, if things are coming against you. The enemy just wants to engage you and push your buttons and get you to say the wrong things or do the wrong things or create more drama than what already is unfolding before you. So that's excellent. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, so it's definitely um, something that we want to ascribe to as uh, believers. We have um, the Holy Spirit residing in us to supernaturally to overcome every evil yeah. tendency. And I just think sometimes we don't draw in that particular area of self-control because, you know, we don't necessarily want to. Um, Galatians 5, and 23 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I put a parenthesis by that ability to shut up, the ability to be quiet. Um, self-control is a God-empowered restraint, but also God-given um, driven desire and is disciplined to do what's right. And sometimes it's just to be quiet. But often this characteristic is looked at as weak. 
I'm sure they had to say that about Jesus, that you're, you're quiet, you're not saying something, stand up for yourself. I come from an area, a background that that's what you did. You know what I'm saying? If somebody says something to you, they disrespected you, and then you disrespect them back. Um, matter of fact, in the, in the, 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 the kids nowadays, they call it the, um, the, the clap back. You know, the, the, you, you, this, this quick response, you said something to me, then I'm going to say something to you. And if you don't do so, then you look that kind of weak. And so clap back when I looked up in the Urban Dictionary, um, it says uh, respond quickly to critical remarks or unfair treatment. And that is something that's um, in our culture that's um, encouraged, that is, that is looked upon as being something that's good. So as soon as you say something to me, I'll say something to you. And um, we parade and we uh, honor that type of behavior in comparison to what Jesus, who said if he wanted to, when he was in that situation, he can send legions of angels. But he didn't say not a word. And so I'm just encouraging us as believers, there are situations that we in, and it may not even necessarily be corrupt communication, something negative, but it's something God wants you to hold your tongue. And that's the, you know, uh, going back to Jesus being in the garden when he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And sometimes it's not God's will for you to open your mouth. You think how many people could stay themselves out of trouble? <laughs> if they just didn't clap back, answer back kept it quiet yeah. walked away yeah, yeah that's good I, yeah. I have a sense that you're probably stepping on a few toes at this point and I think that's okay because we need to know how to uh, how to overcome and how to stay strong and it takes a strong person full of self-control to be able to zip it and keep it closed yeah. when everything in you wants to just I think about, too, a lot of times when we're, we're fighting back with our words or responding with our words is because we've made the issue about us. And it's not about us. It's about him. And it's about the love he wants us to walk in. And as you said, Wayne, sometimes showing that love means shut up. It's poking our pride, yeah. right? Yeah, it's poking at your pride. What are you going to do? Say something, do something, do something. You know, so understanding that voice, where it's coming from, um, that is not the voice of God. Say, so get them. Matter of fact, the Bible talks about uh, the, the vengeance, vengeance is Lord. Make room for his vengeance in the situation. So um, because you're in a situation doesn't mean that you respond. Um, Lord, what should I do in the situations? I put down that there is some times um, when God says, speak up. You know, he's saying, you know, say, Esther, I need you to go to the king and say something, Gideon. I need you to mount up. There's some times that he says it. But a lot of times in the Bible, he says, be still and know that I am God. And so um, in Exodus 14, 13, um, Moses is taking the people of Israel through the wilderness and the Egyptians are coming up on them. And Moses trying to figure out what he should do. And God says to him. In uh, 13, it says, Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which you will see today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. The Lord shall fight for you. So you can either fight your battle yourself or you can have the Lord do so. And I opt for the Lord to do so. And so, um, though it's not always easy, so don't, don't, don't get it twisted. It's something that um, the Lord is cultivating in me now. Um, this is why the scripture stood out to me. It wasn't the fact that I just wanted to tell somebody what to do. This was the Lord <laughs> saying to me. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, yes. You need to hold your tongue. Um, you need to, you said, uh, you can either be right or you can be happy. And, 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 and so sometimes in situations at work, at home, yeah, you are right, and you can tell everybody, and you got the scripture to go along with it. Or you can just be quiet, let the Lord deal with that person, and, and you be happy. And so you don't have to uh, hold the weight of being a strifey um, individual. You know, when God deals with people, when you hold your tongue and you have that kind of ability to know when God is telling you to be quiet, and be still and let God deal with that other person. When God deals with that other person, then it'll be in a way that they receive it, right? Sometimes we want to just run all over people. And we might be right, like you said, and we might have the scripture to back it up. But it's not as effective 
as just allowing God to deal with that person's heart and to make that adjustment in that in that change. Proverbs twenty five twenty eight. Because what I'm talking about is not just only for what we say. It comes down to the fruit of self control. And so, Proverbs twenty five twenty eight says this: He that has no rule over his own spirit or has no self control is like a city that is broken down and without walls. In biblical times, a city whose walls are broken down has no defense against the enemy. You're vulnerable. Your inability to control yourself leaves you vulnerable to the devil coming in and, and ravaging your life because he knows that how you respond, that you cannot control yourself. And a person who has no discipline, willpower, or self-restraint has no defense against anger, lust, impatience, or other unchecked emotions. Without self-control, we are wide open to sin. The word translated self-control means staying within safe, reasonable bounds, avoiding accesses as God helps us govern our life. And so for the, you know, I play basketball, it's always good to stay in bounds. And so um, as, a, as a believer, we were talking about earlier about like some of the things that come into our life, staying away from the curse. And some of it is because we stepped out of bounds. We're doing our own thing. And so this is one of those things. Self-control um, allows for God to move on your behalf. As I thought about this, there was a s several um, biblical stories that, you know, that had pointed to this type of living. And so Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, um, says that at this time, the administrators and the satraps, some other government of officials, tried to, to try to find grounds of charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They can find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And so here, Daniel, he's serving in, uh, in the government. He's doing what he's supposed to do, and he's doing it in such a godly way, in a godly manner. They couldn't find nothing um, to bring charges against him. Which, saying that, though, is understanding that just because you're a believer, you know, don't mean that you ain't going to have no problems. Matter of fact, it probably is going to have some problems because when you start living like God and the favor of God on you, you're going to have some opposition. Opposition, you're going to have some haters. And that's what Daniel has. So these are some haters that's coming against Daniel because he's shining amongst them. Them from this godly living. A shout out to godly living. Amen. Verse 16 <laughs> says, um, so they came up with a they came up with a rule. They came up with a a, a policy um, to get Daniel in trouble. It says anybody that prays to um, God besides the king, they will be uh, guilty of treason and will end up dying. And so Daniel and his faithfulness and his uh, commitment to God um, continued to pray to God, and they caught him doing them. And so they got Daniel to get ready to lock him up. And verse 16 says. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue. So the, so the king, unknowingly, he agreed to this thing type of situation. Um, he's for Daniel, but there's nothing he can do. He already signed the law into legislation, and so here he is, Daniel, going into the lion's den. But surprising for me from verse 16, it don't say Daniel said a word. You know, because I, I, you know, this is another opportunity to speak in tongues, you know, uh, and not the biblical ones, right? You finna throw me in the prison <laughs> for, for serving the Lord and all the stuff I done did for you, king. I done served you. I've been faithful to you. And now you're going to let these people throw me in prison? Let me tell you something. But Daniel doesn't say he said a word. You get to uh, 19. It says, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in the anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Your God, whom you serve, is he able to rescue you? So in the midst of your situation where somebody's coming at your life, whatever, physically, verbally, is your God able? That's the question probably that we have to ask ourselves. The reason why we take some of these matters to our own, our own hand is because we haven't figured out on our mind yet. Could, could you help me, Lord? Can you save me? Can you rescue me? It don't look like you can, so I'm going to go ahead and step up and I'm going to do it myself. 
21, Daniel answered, O king, live forever, which I don't know. That, again, that's a whole other level of living. Um, he's still respectful to the king as the you know, king then threw him in there. D Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor, go ahead. I was going to jump in there real quick. Daniel was still respectful of the authority, even though the authority had turned on him. And that is something that uh, Christians, especially, we would do well to understand, that you don't have to, uh, it's not the person. He addressed the king. And so he was respectful to the office yeah. of the king. And that is very, very important in trusting God to deliver you in situations. If you are continually disrespectful to people in authority around you, you are crossing boundaries that are unscriptural and you are opening yourself up. Had Daniel been disrespectful, the king was going to throw him into the lion's den. Yeah. Had Daniel been disrespectful, those lions would have had a good dinner. Yeah. And if, you know, we'll read a little bit more, but even if naturally speaking, God rescued Daniel from the first day and you came at beef with the king like that, he'll say, okay, then day number two then. Like, you know, with, with day number three, at one point, at some point, I'm going to pressure you into um, I'm having my way as a king. But Daniel and his respect, it was something about it. It changes lives. I think one of the things that, you know, we try to win people over and we try to pray for them, and one of the biggest things we're doing is shutting our mouth, respecting and honoring people is one of the things that changed their lives. The, going back to that scripture initially, it says when Jesus was, uh, quiet, it says, but Jesus still had no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Mm -hmm. And so some of the people around us that's, that we're trying to win over, some of the things that we can do to win them over is some of the simple biblical things, is just being quiet um, and being respectful. Um, it's not necessarily you having this big scripture laying hands on them and all those different things. Um, godly character can win some of these folk over. Verse 23, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no one was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the man who had falsely accused Daniel, those people may have falsely accused you. Those who falsely accused Daniel was brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their families. And so, again, when we trust God, to step in on our behalf. We don't have to fight these battles. There's a song, uh, this is how I fight my battles. And sometimes the way that we fight our battles is being quiet and trusting God to move on our behalf. It's not me stepping in. I'm going to do something. No, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let my God, who I trust, step in and intercede on me. And God is waiting on that. He wants to do that. And just a couple scriptures that um, to, to fortify this idea. Um, Ephesians says, put on a full armor of God so that you may be able to make your stand against the devil. And this is one of the stands that we take when we decide not to take things in our own hand. Take a stand against the devil by being quiet, by showing self-control. And one the pastor, he wrote a list of things. I got a couple of minutes here. I'm just going to read a couple of them off um, areas of or lack of self-control. Um, so he asks, uh, does my speech need self-control? Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of my tongue. With our tongue, we have the power to build people up or tear down. We have the privilege of speaking a word that points down to the Lord or using the speech that causes unbelievers to stumble. It says, does my appetite need self-control? Someone said, I don't need a personal trainer as much as I need someone to follow me around and slap food out of my hand. My one writer shared that every day in America we eat 75 acres of pizzas, 53 million hot dogs, yada, yada, yada. How we overindulge Christians, these are some of the areas that we necessarily, we shouldn't be losing in because we have the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that helped us overcome some of those over, other evil tendencies in our lives will help us with these areas of, of self-control. I know for me, I talked about in previous uh, uh, messages about my weed addiction and not having self-control in that area and then and praying to God, being humble, saying, I need help in this area, Lord, and he was able to deliver me. It wasn't overnight, um, 
but you know, here it is 15 years later and I haven't smoked um, in 15 years. And so God will help us in these areas if we ask him. Um, he talked about spending, needing self-control, our emotions. He says, we mentioned road rage, but what, what about the ball fields? Tracy probably would have loved this if he was here. He says, have you ever gotten too carried away while watching your children play ball? He says, a Florida Sun um, investigation reported that more than once a month in South Florida, a parent of an athlete punches another parent, storms a playing field, or spits on a referee. And this could be probably some Christians in the midst of all of that. The one parent spits on you, you spit back, you know, you clap back. That's, you know, that's, as we talk, put that on Instagram, you know, make a, uh, what's that little short thing that the... Uh, TikTok, yeah, a TikTok video of a Christian spitting on some other lady at a, at a, a baseball game. What a witness that is for the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, so just being conscious as we desire to live this life for the Lord, um, trusting him um, to, to, to fight our battles. And, um, and I guess before Jesus said this profound thing or didn't say anything, this this ability to be quiet, but Jesus still made no reply. I was, I, I thought about him being in a garden. He had, this was premeditated. So some of us as believers needs to make some decisions before these situations arise on us. That we seek God's will for a situation and regardless to whatever our desires is, we let God's desires supersede those. And so and as we do that, um, by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, um, we will see fruit in our lives. We'll see God's blessing. We'll see God stepping in. And so one example of that is when I first got saved, uh, I had a car that I just got painted. It was real nice and shiny and, and all that good stuff. And um, it started to rust a little bit on the bottom. And so I took it back into the shop to get that touched up. Two days later, he called me back and says um, that my car got stolen and he's not responsible for it. And so you talk about the land on of hands. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, all of the things that need to be done in order to make this just or make this right. Um, but thank God for his grace as a new believer. He calls me to to be still and, and to know that he is God. And so um, I was so profound because my boss um, came in and said, man, you seem really calm understanding the situation, uh, understanding the situation. And so when, when again, it's a testimony to people that the power of God in your life is not because you can speak in tongues. I mean, that's, that's, that's necessary. But if you can show in a situation like that, that you can hold yourself, that God can, um, can control you, contain you. And so so here's where I'm at work, and I, somebody must have told another customer about it. And so I was uh, approached by a customer who said that he's a lawyer, and he would uh, take my case pro bono. Okay. And so um, the man comes in and uh, uh, gives me his uh, card, and so I go downtown to his little fancy office, and he helps me fill out all the paperwork, and we ask for a certain amount of money, and... Um, I end up getting more money than we requested. And at the same time, somebody had gave me a truck. So I didn't even need the money for that. I was able to do something else with it. And so this is why we want to let God fight our battles. His ways are higher and bigger and grander than ours. And so, um, so be still, um, know that he is God, and uh, the Holy Spirit will empower you in these times and these situations. And so um, that's pretty much all I have to say. I don't know if you have anything wrapping up. That was awesome. Yeah. What a great cool. testimony, yeah. too, uh, that when we hold our peace, God can fight the battle for us. But if you would have jumped into that situation and laid some hands on that person, you might not actually be standing here today. Amen. Uh, so, yes. you know, and I, I'm sure some of the brothers in uh, Stillwater Understand. can relate, but this is an opportunity when you hear a message like this to go, you know what? He did it. We've learned it. There's been times where I've had to hold my peace when, boy, I got to go yell in a pillow or something, <laughs> you know. Take a walk. When you don't want to, take a walk, yeah. do whatever you need to do. Uh, but let God mm. help you develop that self-control in your life. 
And as you step out, you're gonna, I guarantee you, you listen to a message like this, you're probably going to have an opportunity to exercise some self-control within this week. <laughs> <laughs> and so we just pray, Father, yes. in the name of Jesus, that you help all of us all of to us. exercise that self-control, to hold our peace, to seek it, to pursue it, to not let anything take that peace from us. And if we need to hold our tongues, then Holy Spirit, put a guard on our lips in the name of Jesus. And so before we... Um, wrap up this message we just want to invite you uh, those of you that maybe have never surrendered to Jesus never uh, invited him into your heart to be your savior to be your Lord you know you're not going to have any power to do what Wayne ministered on without that supernatural power of God that lives on the inside and when we have a relationship with Jesus he comes into our heart he takes up residence we can be strong in the in the Lord the power of his might on the inside of us he strengthens us by his spirit in our inner man and so we just want to give people an opportunity to invite Jesus into their heart do you want to pray the prayer of salvation yeah. Yeah. and we'll follow along Lord God Lord mm. God we, we come to you humbly. We come mm. to you humbly. Mm. Admitting our sin. And we admit our sin. Father, your word says all have fallen short of the glory of God. Your word says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. But your word also says. But your word also says. That if we confess our sins. That if we confess our sins. You are faithful and just. You are faithful and just. To forgive us of all unrighteousness. To forgive us of all unrighteousness. So right now we turn our life over to you. So right now we turn our life over to you. We accept Jesus' sacrifice because of our sin. We accept Jesus' sacrifice because of our sin. We accept the blood of Jesus. We accept the blood of Jesus. And Father, we walk, we receive your free gift of salvation. And Father, we receive your free gift of salvation. We make you Savior and Lord. We make you Savior and Lord. And so, Father, as I pray this, a lot of times, Father, we accept your gift of salvation. We will allow you to be Savior, but not Lord. So, Father, I just pray for a supernatural um, grace for them to walk out the words that we spoke in the day, the words, Lord God, from your, your word, Lord God, that will empower them to have change, that they wouldn't be spiritually frustrated, Lord God, that as they entrust in you and they do these things, Lord God, that you would move mightily on their behalf, Father. So I thank you, Father God, that you're faithful to, conf to perform your word. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for joining us, and we will see you again soon. Have a blessed day.